Okay. Okay. So can you all hear me? Yes. Perfect. So I'm Halle Dertz. I'm working at GIZ. I'm very honored to uh, have the session today, um, which is early childhood interventions tailored for low income and rural settings. And I think with the opening ceremony, we all already have heard that inclusive education is just um, it's a buzzword, but it contains very, very different topics and we should uh, look upon them all. And here we have the focus on early childhood interventions, which I personally also like a lot because I am a wheelchair uh, driver, as you as you can see. And for those who cannot see me, I am I'm wearing uh, completely uh, green uh, trousers and T-shirt and a vest um, also to be the, the color of the Euro project today. And I'm very delighted to um, to give the floor today to my awardees. And uh, yeah, we are just searching for another presenter, but we will just go on now because we don't have the time, as you all know. And um, yeah, I'm very really delighted to present here five, actually five awardees. Um, and we having uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, then we have the US, which is here at my right, um, with, Kay, uh, with uh, Kate Miller. And I will just uh, shortly give the word to you that you present uh, all of us. And yeah, you're welcome that you are here. <laughs> uh, and uh, I will just give the floor to you to present just um, yourself and say your organization and your name, please. And I will start with dear Kate. So just say your name and then we present. Yes, and then we go over to Tabish Shazat. Hi, my name is Tabish Shazad and I'm representing KDSP from Pakistan. Great, thank you so much. Then we have uh, Di Diana Vincent online. So also a warm welcome to all persons that, that are watching us online this session here. Um, so can you speak, Diana? Do you hear thank us? You. Yes, mm -hmm. Ellie. Do you hear me? Yes. yes, we hear you very well. Yes. Yeah, thank you. And I'm Diana Joseph representing the fourth wave foundation from India and uh, physically in the room with you all are two teammates of mine, Tiravi M. G., fondly known as Ravi G., and uh, Suma Ramanna uh, in the audience as well. So they've come all the way from India to join you all um, and I'll be here with you all online. Great. So um, then we have your colleague here, uh, which is on on the left hand, uh, on the right hand side from my side. Uh, could you quickly just introduce your name, please? Mm -hmm. <laughs> As Diana said that my name is Duraviyam, but people call me Ravi because it's a difficult name to pronounce. But you can all call me Ravi and we work along together on inclusive education. Thank you. Thank you. So just to say that Diana is doing the presentation online, but um, if there are some questions that also uh, um, Tiriam could answer, then you can also post this question to him later in the end of our session. So and that takes me to the last uh, presenter, which is um, Surabi Agarwal. Hi, I'm Surabhya Garwal. Uh, I'm here on behalf of my organization, Love for Life Rehabilitation Services. I flew down from India, New Delhi. Exactly. And there is last, not, but last but not least, in the last minute, we have Farida Yasmin. Hi, yeah, hi, this is Farida. I'm from Bangladesh. I'm re representing Disability Rehabilitation and Research Association. 
Okay, thank you so much, dear, dear Wadi. So, um, yeah, I'm really proud that we're having such an international round here. That's really great. Um, I'm personally also working for for another country um, where I'm working in Germany, but I'm working for a project in Yemen as an inclusion advisor. And I'm also quite into the inclusive education uh, space also in my earlier years of professionality. So um, that really um, makes me looking forward to the session here. And um, yeah, also a warm welcome to all our sign language interpreters. They are also very important. And of course, with no further ado, I would like to start with the first presentation. And we will begin with uh, Tabish Shazat, if I pronounce it right. It's your turn. Please go ahead. Thank you, Ale. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Tabish Azad, and I'm 5.8 feet tall, a female with black hair. And today I'm wearing black clothes with a colorful scarf. First of all, I would like to congratulate and thank you and Vienna, the Essel Foundation and the Zero Project team for such a wonderful gathering today where everyone shares their mission of having a world with zero barriers. Thank you for giving me and my colleague Maha Rao the opportunity to represent our country at the Zero Project Conference and talk about the work KD KDSP does back home. KDSP, a Down syndrome organization, was born out of a beautiful, born out of a birth of a beautiful soul that you can all see in the picture. How do I move the presentation? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> it is a nonprofit organization that was launched in March 2014 by a group of concerned parents and individuals who, due to uh, limited support and resources available, realized a need for a platform for those with Down syndrome. Hence, KDSP was formed with the mission to advocate the value, acceptance and inclusion of people with Down syndrome in our country and aims to provide them with the opportunity to lead independent and fulfilling lives. We understand the needs of individuals with Down syndrome and their loved ones. So from the moment a family with a child with Down syndrome is introduced to us, KDSP embarks on a journey with them until they feel empowered, included and equal members of society. We serve as a boat for our family network as they navigate the waters of life, carrying them through our six areas of service. Can I operate my presentation from here? Yeah. In order to make services more accessible to parents and to bridge the gap, KDSP aims to provide a one-stop solution as a first of its kind. We provide all services under one roof from the time of the child's birth until they are independent individuals. We act as a one-stop holistic solution for children with Down syndrome. I'll briefly take you over our six areas of services which are, we provide family support to empower parents. We inform the world about Down syndrome to create a more inclusive society through awareness. We provide access to affordable, high quality healthcare to ensure complete peace of mind for the parents. We focus on skills and talents of individuals with Down syndrome through vocational training and talent development programs. We provide children with Down syndrome to access mainstream educational systems. Lastly, we provide speech therapy, occupational therapy and physical therapy for children with Down syndrome to help achieve their developmental milestones timely. When we talk about education, there are multiple obstacles that children with Down syndrome face when it comes to accessing quality education. The first one being school readiness. In comparison to typical students, these children need just a little extra accommodation and adjustment to help them be ready for mainstream schools. This early intervention is crucial to help develop a more solid foundation. 
Second problem is transitioning into mainstream schools as there are very few schools that are inclusive and very little leadership buy in as well. There is very limited information amongst the parents about these schools. Another challenge is that the mainstream schools have when it comes to enrolling students with Down syndrome. While they are legally obligated to admit students with special needs, there is little or no enforcement at all. Schools don't want to invest in inclusion. For them, it is the harder path to take, and so they often refuse admissions. And even when they do, the teachers and staff are simply practicing inclusion because they have been mandated to, but don't have the inclusion mindset. That's where KDSP's preschool program comes into play, specifically designed to prepare a child with Down syndrome for a confident transition into mainstream schools, taking into account each child's needs. The purpose of this preschool program is to help students become ready for mainstream school by focusing on their motor, cognitive and social skills and teaching them basic self-help skills by nurturing their individual strengths. This is also backed by financial support to parents so that the child's development does not get affected by any barrier. To dive a bit deeper into our program, we take in children between the ages of 1.5 to 3 who might also be taking other services from KDSP. These children are part of our program for one year where through individualized education plans, we work to enhance their social, intellectual and physical skills. Their typical day starts with circle time to help with their social and cognitive skills. Then they move on to smaller group gatherings where with a ratio of two students per teacher, they work on different skills at each station, and then they end their day with an outdoor play to focus on their gross motor movements. This entire program also enables them to develop better sitting tolerance, healthy parental attachment, and better routine. To help our families with the challenges they face other than school readiness, transitioning into mainstream schools, we conduct regular parent tra training sessions, which could all include sessions on how to work with their children, how to manage their behaviors, how to understand what inclusion is, how to identify inclusive schools, and many more. And how do we do that? We help connect parents with inclusive schools. We have developed an inclusion index that fits our local context, and we assess schools based on the same tool so that we can give parents complete information about these schools based on our criteria. In terms of the schools we work with, we work with, their, with them with their infrastructural and curriculum adjustment so that they feel more ready to enroll our students. Finally, to capacitate the mainstream schools further, we conduct awareness sessions as well. Now I have a video to share a story of a child who is currently enrolled in our preschool program. Education has always been a priority to us, but when we learned about Alina's diagnosis, we were lost. Will she go to a school? Will any school be willing to admit her? This caused a lot of anxiety and I felt helpless. I had no idea what the right way was to prepare her for mainstream schools. And on top of that, I wasn't even sure if these schools were inclusive enough or not. Would they wholeheartedly accept my child? Luckily, when Alina started taking therapies at the Karachi Down Syndrome program, I was told that they have a school readiness program as well. And that's when I knew I had to send Alina here. When Alina started this school readiness program, it provided her with an opportunity to socialize, interact, and sit for long durations comfortably. Through station time, she also gets focus attention by the teacher, and she also ensures that she is learning better. They focus on quality and constantly work towards improvement. I also love how they give special attention to activities to build and develop their fine motor skills. Through the program, Alina has also developed a routine. 
which makes it so easy for me and her to follow one at home as well i'm really excited for her to join a mainstream school like the graduates before her i'm so excited for her future the best part is the journey with kdsp just doesn't end once the kids graduate after the admission process kdsp not only helps us with the coordination with schools it also helps to create individualized educational plans and it also constantly works towards creating inclusive landscape for pakistan so i'm really happy to say that align eyes in safe hands thank you looking back i'm proud to say that kdsp has come a long way since the inception of its school readiness program and 80 plus adorable children with down syndrome have graduated from this program due to these early interventions and trainings of around 300 plus staff and educators in 60 plus mainstream schools at least 85% of our graduates have been enrolled in mainstream schools the program in itself is sustainable as it is replicable easily there is a structured plan in place available tools knowledge and training modules this is proven by the fact that the, we were able to successfully set up our third facility very recently in another city this is not to say that there were no challenges the biggest one being lack of social inclusion at multiple levels and dimensions existence of financial challenges and regulating inclusion quotas so the rights are not just passed but ensured Lastly I would like to talk about what are the next steps of KDSP. Yeah, I'm sorry could you wrap up a little bit because we are running out of time. Just a minute. Just last. <laughs> Thank you. Couple of minutes. We plan to expand our preschool and inclusion programs by serving more children. We would like to scale our models to other parts of the country. We would also like to work on capacity building of mainstream schools through more awareness and sensitization sessions and teacher trainings. advocating and lobbying for enforcing each child's right to education and last but not the least conducting and publishing research for more contextualized approaches for students with down syndrome that's it thank you any questions so thank you so much uh, tabish for this uh, nice presentation and also this really um lively video which shows us that inclusive education is so important and that also the the children with down syndrome they have they are, they should be in focus in this project and i think that's really unique and with this um, if you have some questions please uh, note them down and you can post them later in the end of the session so i will make sure that you all can make your your quotes and your your questions um and with this um i would like to hand over from pakistan to india so the first presenter from india because we have uh, two here um but i will go now to uh, diana vincent online and uh, not forgetting that she um, she is also sitting here on the panel Thank you, Ali. Okay, thank you. I have studied languages, but not this one, so uh, so I'm sorry about it. <laughs> um, yeah. With no further ado, uh, Diana, it's now your turn, and um, yeah, please speak about your project, please. Right. Um, I hope the presentation is visible. There. Uh, It I, is. Yes, I have the controls at my end. So. um to start off thank you to the zero project team uh, thank you for the recognition of this award it means a lot to fourthway foundation because we've been on this project for two decades now and uh, in two decades what we've achieved uh, is clearly the recognition and the acknowledgement that you are also giving us so thanks to the zero project team and thank you all for hosting us as well thanks helly for being the uh, moderator here and letting me and ravi be on this panel with you um so with a little introduction 
Digital Pathway Foundation. I just want to take you directly into the program that's got the recognition and the award. Uh, we call the program Schools Where All Belong. Uh, technically, because we believe that no child should be left out of the educational system because of any kind of special need or any need. And what we do on this program has become a classic example where the state has emulated it. And we're now looking at expanding into other regions, other states in India, because it is a replicable, scalable model that we've created over the two decades. It's very simple. It's not rocket science. It's stuff that anybody with a little willful approach can uh, replicate and uh, have it have it in their own systems. Uh, these are the five areas that primarily have given success uh, to this model that we've built. One is the access to education. We believe all children have access to education in their local nearest government school or the school public school that is closest to them. And we believe that children, all children uh, uh, need to have an individualized education plan. And when it comes to children with needs, they definitely cannot be um, sidelined because of the need for an IEP. We believe in access to therapy, uh, which is one of the key elements that supports their learning uh, requirements through, throughout the life cycle of the child. Mainstreaming is our key agenda because uh, we do see that the special ed space has actually contributed to eliminating and sidelining and keeping kids away over time when they finish their uh, specialization in schools. But mainstreaming does have its own great benefits uh, starting early on. And early education, mainstreaming plays a key role. And our USP here in the entire program is that it's tech enabled. Uh, we have the entire program such uh, that it's live data and children are supported by therapy and learning through tech. These are the five key areas where we believe that the IEP has to have a key intervention when children with early education programs are considered. And all of this is uh, in a philosophy that's built on learning beyond the classroom. And these are built on life skills learning. And this module is available for anybody who is willing to replicate it. And, you know, we are willing to uh, share those insights. This is the typical learning system in an early education, low resource setting. All of what we've built at Fourth Way Foundation uh, with the philosophy of inclusion has always been in very remote, rural and the back of the boondock settings. Uh, these are the places where children really don't have the access to education. They don't have um, the systems that enable their uh, inclusion in a regular government school setting. And that's where we go in and create these replicable models and children actually learn beyond the classroom, not only children with special needs, but then it's become a reverse inclusion process where children with regular uh, learning needs also find this kind of a learning uh, more exciting and fruitful and long lasting in terms of what they take home and what they build themselves with. Uh, this is our biggest uh, you know, USP, like I keep saying. We've managed to create networks of people, doctors, therapists, um, all kinds of uh, people who can render services uh, with a networked program through our base. Uh, they dial in into the remote settings where these therapists and uh, people are not available. And we network and uh, provide this bridge through technology uh, that's helped all our children and to a great deal in also letting them see the outside world. Um, from that little village and rural setting, they're actually opening their life into a larger window of access and uh, process that really opens their uh, minds and lives. This is simply to show you that everything, uh, the life cycle of a child within the rich school settings that we have is tracked. Uh, data is uh, very important to all of us, and data privacy is something that we really struggle to keep in, um, uh, for, for children with disabilities. So we've built these modules where data is live about every child, every progress, week on week, month on month. And technically, over the year and over a middle school, primary school, or a high school setting, we clearly can track the progress to say, OK, these are the early skilling requirements for a child. This is where the child needs to focus. OK, this child cannot go beyond this, but here these are the other options. So this is something that we've clearly developed and we've got recognized by HP and uh, they've digitized the entire module for us in the last two years. I uh, just want to close uh, saying that Fourth Way Foundation has built something that is easily replicable and in low resource settings, whatever we do, 
even the slightest change that we bring to the lives of these children really uh, create the biggest difference for their lives. And we've been, um, you know, documented by various, uh, uh, various, various companies, processes, um, and uh, inclusive education frameworks. And uh, this is just one link for you to go and check uh, of our latest feature on BBC uh, with HP digitizing our entire module. So with to close, I just want to say that um, we are happy that uh, you have picked us at Zero Conference. I have Mr. Ravi uh, with you all at the venue, Suma Ramana also from my team with you all there. And I'm hoping you all will find the time uh, to share, speak, understand our program and also link to see how we, our networks can be built for each other's uh, benefits. Thank you all. And I'm open for questions if there's any at the end of the framework. And uh, Ravi is there with you all at the hall. Thank you. I hope I'm well in time, Helly, for you. Thank you so much, Diana. Um, I, I think this really also this. I'm speechless. So there are so so many projects going into inclusive education, and we see that there are, there are so many topics that have to be implemented in. And yeah, we see here that we are all working towards an inclusive education, and um, this is really great. And we. Uh, try now to go to another country uh, because we see that the whole world is working towards it and we are here as a family to promote this and this takes me to um, Farida Yasmin from Bangladesh so go ahead please yeah, thank your... you uh, I'm representing my organization named Disabled Rehabilitation <coughs> Research Association uh, we are working around three decades in Bangladesh, uh, where we are promoting inclusion and empowerment. So before my presentation, I, I am willing to give the big thanks to my community, my parents, sponsor, and the organizers who are really make it real. So uh, first, I like to show a short videos um, as a part of my presentation. Yeah, somebody's really. Okay. There is no sound. We are lacking the sound. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if the sound is not working, you can also describe what the video is. Uh, talking about instead and we okay. hope that you can find this out. Actually, this is the program we are explaining. Uh, we call the Varanda Education, where uh, train villagers are really come in this place. This is not a rented place. Uh, the parents are really running the school. Uh, we call it uh, Varanda. Everybody is not the courtyard education. So this education program we started more than uh, two decades with a little number of the children. So I'm now going for the full presentation. Uh, is, can somebody really help with changing the slide? OK, yeah. So actually, we this education, our age group is 3 plus to 5 plus, the children with disabilities. And also, there is open for the children without disabilities, as it is non-formal education. So here we are really incorporating three things. It is the early intervention, early childhood education, and also focus the play-based learning. As I mentioned, this group is three plus. So they are really uh, very much a really positive response we get when we use the play-based uh, learning therapy uh, for our children development. Actually, this place is more a really open place. It's for three to four hour a session. Uh, a community teacher, which is trained by us and also affiliated by the government, uh, she's the leader of this session. And uh, every uh, week, uh, there is a three class session, and we are operating. 
and we provided the therapy for early intervention screening and also uh, we do follow the uh, developmental milestone how the children are growing you know that in our many cases in the three pluses many disability cannot be diagnosed and the assess so it's help a lot for the parents and for the teacher to understand the children growth about the disabilities especially the autism intellectual disability is quite difficult to understand then uh, here the most innovative part we really success here uh, that we engage the community volunteers one children for one volunteer and they are not the member of the families so we have around uh, at present like 2000 children with disabilities are in the community under this program and there is a 2000 volunteer really each for one they are all the college student our motivation is that after some time they can make a friend in the community it needs help to any you know in bangladesh is very inaccessible community road transport is not accessible children cannot go to the school even the school are really open for the inclusion so these volunteers are really helping them to bring the children the education next please so here what i like to mention some facts and figure that um, in our country we uh, country context we do quite few research uh, because this program we started in 2012 and we are really submit for this award after three research two research was the action research we found that 54 from seven four percent have no formal education in Bangladesh. The similar I listened today morning that we have 2. Uh, 241 million children are disabilities in the education age. Only 50% are enrolled in the education. Actually, there is also a gap. Uh, there is a big number are enrolled and admitted, but they are not continuing their education. The huge number are drop out in the primary education level. Then uh, there is a huge number of the dropout. In our local research, we found this in primary school level, we have admitted around 70% of the children with disabilities. But in the class three level, at 60% are dropped out because of the accessibility education and also the non-accessible environment. So we found uh, after one decade action research project to this uh, that if we are really good taking care of the early intervention program, then the number of dropout is less because the school's readiness are really happen. Parents are really more understanding the children needs and children also try to cope with their disability and also the education system. So what we did, next please. Actually, we call it the tailor-made curriculum and other name is appropriate curriculum because in our country, early childhood education is part of the women and children affairs, not is the part of the education ministry even because they are early childhood development. It is not a formal education and also it is not a part of the special education. In a special education, there is no age group, but in a formal education, five plus age group. In five plus, only mild and moderate children can get admitted in the normal school. So because of that, more number of children cannot admit it. So that's why we make this uh, early childhood education curriculum adapted version that children can learn and then they can take them according to the teacher are really trained on that way. We also incorporated therapeutic intervention, lifelong learning as a part of education. As we all understand that when is the early childhood education, they need assistive device with adaptation. They need uh, epilepsy related medicine. They need physiotherapy based on the children, individual education or rehabilitation assessment needs. So here we really incorporated the community hospital or the government hospital so they can get the referral facilities because the health needs still exist with the children. We call it run by the community. In fact, we are not really agreed to call it as a project because we are running around two decades. It's running most of the cases by the local government. We are giving some money, which is more the skill development, more on the assistive devices, but not for the other reason. Also, many cases, mothers are the teacher. You know, if you check the community, most of the cases, mother are really the big backbone of the children care. So that's why we created the education curriculum and also the training curriculum for the mothers. Also to train the volunteers. Next, please. So there is some number that 
we started in 2012 and until now we are in 1307 children who are really enrolled and continue their education in 2013 this education program over 7800 students and across 35 schools in different communities more than 6000 students with disability newly thriving the mainstream classroom so what i want to tell you here that in our country education policy is excellent but children cannot enroll especially the neurodevelopment disabilities like cerebral palsy intellectual disabilities or the deaf blind they cannot really uh, enroll in the education so this program truly helpful for uh, this target group uh, next please we we do this project first pilot with us in three location urban and rural then we practice in a three different local partners. Most of our OPDs, organization, people with disabilities. You know, they are working in the community and voluntarily. And parents also living in the community. And I, as I mentioned, the 10 villagers are really targeted for that one Varan uh, school. So it's very community centered. And we have all the tools, books, IRP, IP, individual need assessment. And also we have the online database for this all children's. Because if these children need a very continuous and follow up uh, for their rehabilitation, also for their continuing education, because this is the beginning. So all the information, reports, uh, credit cards is helpful for their referral education. Actually, in, in uh, this 2024, we are really planning to expand it in other regions in uh, uh, the Asia, like uh, Nepal and also the um, Sri Lanka, because we discuss uh, these issues with our network and they find it that this is one of the biggest challenge that parents looking a solution and we can give the solution to the parents. Of course, there is a local stakeholder that is necessary. It could be the school, it could be the parents' organization, it could be the OPDs, it could be the NGO, even it could be the government. Any stakeholder can lead this program. So uh, I have one more slide. So for this education program, we are really want to share two, two more issues that uh, this early childhood education, many number of children cannot really graduate and they cannot go to the further level because their opportunity of learning grow and their full potential cannot be in a small place. A number of parents who are living in the rural area or the urban slum, they don't have that uh, economical or the social context, they can continue their education. So we, we adapted here the lifelong learning if a children cannot really continue uh, their education skill, we included their activities and daily livings, life skill, and lifelong communication when they are in the age group in five plus based on their milestone. And we are really, the other day is presenting their education model second time since zero project. We was awarded in 2022 for our lifelong learning and the non-formal non and vocational education. And here I am presenting about our early childhood education. So we call it a breeze education from early childhood to lifelong learning. Thank you so much for listening to us. Uh, we have a couple of videos. We have digital platform for the teaching learning materials and also the parents guideline. It is it is free for everyone. We, it is in English and local language in Bangla. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Farina, for this uh, really great presentation. And I'm really sorry about the fact that the video is not being uh, shown with sound but i think we can make it sure that that you can watch the video afterwards um via youtube or other media channel um and uh, i just wanted to give you also some some buzzwords to 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 conclude this um presentation i think this presentation really has shown us that uh participation and inclusive education is really key that without participation we we can't reach it and um, it is it, we have to um, to look for equal participation that every child is being served and that is also this peer counseling that there is one 
one uh, one person for another person with a disability and they are, that they are interacting with each other. I think participation is here key and um, this is just something what I wanted to raise, to raise here again. And um, with this, um, I uh, would like to go all around the globe to the US to uh, Kate Miller, uh, with, uh, who is working at Spoon. So floor is yours. Thank you, Hella. Uh, thank you to the Zero Project Conference team, to the SL Foundation and to the UN for hosting this great event. Um, like Hella said, my name is Kate and uh, it is my honor to represent Spoon uh, and the work that uh, we do in our innovation, which is Count Me In. Uh, a visual description, I'm a white woman from the US with brown hair. I'm wearing a black jacket over a copper shirt. Okay, so we know that you're familiar with this population, but before I dive in to Spoon and our work, I want to share a few key points that are imp important from a nutrition standpoint. Children with disabilities experience high rates of malnutrition due to the lack of inclusive nutrition support. They are three times more likely to be malnourished and twice as likely to die from malnutrition. Up to 80% of children with disabilities have feeding difficulties, which can lead to illness or death if unaddressed. Feeding skills or the ability to safely and efficiently eat and drink develop as a child grows. Like other areas of child development, feeding skills develop over time and with opportunities to practice. There are many reasons that a child may have feeding difficulties and feeding difficulties can impact many aspects of children's lives. Malnutrition and a lack of community-based services are major drivers of institutionalization for children with disabilities. And improving nutrition and feeding can facilitate children being able to fulfill their rights to health, community living, participation, education, and are more in line with the UNCRPD. Children with disabilities are often excluded from nutrition policies, programs, and investments, either completely not mentioned, or there's a lack of strategies to ensure their needs are met. This includes not gathering data on the nutrition and feeding status of children with disabilities in many countries. Spoon is a global NGO based in the US, and we're dedicated to improving the feeding and nutrition of children with disabilities. We've implemented programs in 21 countries, and we work with local partners to strengthen healthcare systems and empower local communities through a holistic approach. Spoon's model combines training, a digital health app, and advocacy in a system-wide approach for sustainable impact to reduce malnutrition in children with disabilities. This practice is implemented in partnership with civil society and governments in multiple settings. Spoon's work aims to strengthen support for children with disabilities and children without family care, who often experience feeding difficulties and malnutrition. The first component of our model is training. Spoon delivers training to equip families, caregivers, and professionals to safely nourish children with disabilities. We train service providers in health, social work, child care, rehabilitation, and early child development to build skills in nutrition, feeding, disability, and child development. Service providers use training to coach and support families and caregivers in safe, responsing, responsive feeding and nutrition practices, such as diet diversity, safe positioning, and appropriate food textures. Trainees acquire these skills through practice and application of knowledge. Spoon's training has been de delivered digitally, in person, and in a hybrid format. While training is typically customized to the needs of the partner and the project, it covers a variety of topics, such as developmental feeding skills, best practices for mealtime, specialized feeding techniques, and counseling caregivers on nutrition and feeding, to name a few.
The second component of our intervention model is our web-based app, Count Me In. This digital health app provides customized support for ongoing application of knowledge and skills. Count Me In is designed to bridge training with practice to strengthen nutrition care delivery for children with disabilities, while at the same time generate data. It's a web-based app and it has four modules. We look at growth, anemia, mealtime, and developmental screening. Uh, each module guides the user through a series of questions and tasks. Uh, so a nurse, for example, could use Count Me In to assess and monitor feeding difficulties, growth, development, or anemia, anemia status for children over time. On this slide, you can see screenshots from some of the pages found in Count Me In. After each assessment, the app generates individualized care plans, including WHO growth charts, nutrition recommendations, and specialized feeding techniques. And then service providers use those recommendations to coach families and caregivers in safe and responsive nutrition and feeding practices. Count Me In also supports improvements in nutrition and feeding practices at facilities like schools, daycares, community centers, or in residential care. Users get data and a variety of easy to read reports to assist with their decision making as well. The third component of Spoon's model is advocacy. As trained service providers use Count Me In, the data collected provide insight into the feeding and nutrition needs of the children with disabilities in their program or throughout their country. And then it demonstrates change over time. We always work to ensure that the data and evidence our programs generate are shared with decision makers and used to increase understanding of the need to focus on this population. We don't just replicate our successful trainings and programs, we also leverage our data to reach as many children as possible through advocacy. Depending on the context, this could include reaching out to policymakers to educate them, providing technical input to policies, guidelines, and tools. For example, our work has been used to inform policies in health and alternative care. Uh, doing outreach to nutrition program practitioners and funders, or participating in or leading coalitions to advocate for others to use inclusive policies. In 2022, Spoon trained nearly 600 people in nine countries, who in turn reached over 14,000 children. We saw that number increase in 2023. Uh, as of January 2024, we have more than 4,000 children who've been assessed in Count Me In, and we continue to see that number increase each year. Beyond that, we estimate that millions of children will also benefit from uh, the inclusive policies. In our work, we have had success reducing key indicators of malnutrition, while also ensuring that children with disabilities are fed in safe and responses matter. Among the 4, 000, over 4,000 children monitored in Count Me In, we've seen a reduction in rates of anemia of about 39% and wasting by about 21%. Training evaluations and internal program evaluations have shown us that not only does it increase knowledge and skills, uh, but we've seen improvements in screening, referrals, and site level practices. This work has contributed to advocacy priorities in Lesotho. Zambia, and Uganda. In Zambia, we advocated for our local partners to the Parliamentary Committee on Health, Community Development, and Social Services to prioritize children's disabilities and for inclusion in COVID responses, the Public Welfare Awareness Scheme, and nutrition policies. In Uganda, we contributed to disability inclusion and national nutrition guidelines. We've also influenced global policies, including legislation on inclusive early child development in US funded international programs. In addition to the immediate impact, improving nutrition has long ranging benefits for children. Proper nutrition and safe nurturing feeding environments provide essential building blocks for long term health, growth and development. They also contribute to family care and community living for children with disabilities. Before I wrap up, let me just give you a few brief examples of our work 
In Zambia, we're working with local partners to incorporate nutrition into programs and policies that are serving families of children with disabilities. In Lesotho, alongside UNICEF, Lesotho local partners, and a multi-sectoral team, we're linking developmental screening and nutrition screening in preschools and health centers. And in Uganda, we're integrating nutrition and feeding into family care and deinstitutionalization and improving data on nutrition and feeding status of children with disabilities. Boone's comprehensive approach uh, is, is in order to make a sustainable impact. Um, we believe that it can benefit children even beyond the immediate scope of our programs. Our system-wide approach supports sustainable impact to improve services, family care, and policy environments. It's adaptable to a range of contexts and allows frontline workers and caregivers to implement safe, responsive nutrition and feeding practices based on personalized care plans adapted to the needs of children with disabilities. Our approach has been replicated within and across countries. We work in partnership with local partners and technical advisory groups to contextualize um, and align with relevant guidelines, local customs, and other contextual factors. Since 2016, Count Me In has been translated into six languages and adopted in eight countries. And Spoon's training has been used in more than 10 countries. And uh, we could not do this work without the generosity and commitment of our uh, funders and the foundations and the donors who um, contribute to our work. And I see them at times, so I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Kate. Um, I think this really shows that, uh, that um, nutrition and um, Health is all going is all going in together when we are talking about education, and it's really like the basement of that the people that the person and the children with disabilities are also able to really go to the school or to 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 uh, to go to school online and to have the energy to really uh, also being trained and to interact with the other children. So that that's really great and. Um, also, the Count Me In app also shows that ICT is also crucial in inclusive education and that there are various, various ways to uh, implement all together. And um, then I go um, to the last speaker of the session today, um, which is uh, Surabi Agarwal, another time from uh, from India, in uh, in the um, the her startup organization is uh, based in New Delhi, and uh, yes, so Ravi, it's your turn. Please go ahead. Thank you, Elay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm um, Surabhi Agarwal, as Helen introduced, uh, founder of Love for Life Rehabilitation Services. So uh, I really want to thank SL Foundation for giving me and my partner Himanshu Rora this opportunity to attend this amazing conference. And um, I'm an Asian female from India, and I stand 5.4 feet tall, and I'm wearing a black and blue sari today with a matching blouse, black blouse. I wear specs, and uh, I have my hair held in a bun. So as you can see, uh, then my startup is Love for Life Rehabilitation Services, and uh, the motto for it is Nurturing Root for a Stronger Tree. So uh, before I start, uh, I'm very fortunate to present this work in front of you. My startup provide home-based and uh, online therapy therapeutic services pan India to, to children from age, majority of children are from age group two to six years. So basically these children have intellectual difficulties, uh, physical disabilities or uh, sensory integration issues, etc. So before I take you forward, I want to share a small personal story with you why I started this. So in 2009, my mother, she suffered stroke and she was paralyzed from the left side. And uh, she was well, she was home, but she was paralyzed. And there were not even a single occupational therapist available in our city to give her therapy. So my father has to take a long break of six to eight months from her job and she was back to Delhi uh, for, her, for her rehabilitation. So, uh, and once shifted back our base to Delhi, uh, there was, it was very difficult and inconvenient, in, inconvenient to carry her, uh, to take her to therapy centers or to hospitals. So, 
uh, it was really inconvenient. So, uh, so I thought if my mother is, we are facing so much issue, and then there must be a million others who must be facing the same issue. So this is why uh, I thought and I gave this a try. So the challenges, I already discussed one challenge with you uh, in my mother's story is geographical challenge. And uh, there, there are multiple other challenges. As you can see, there are financial constraints. Uh, these therapies are not cheap. They are not cheap. Okay, cultural barrier, language barrier is a huge barrier. Uh, indicated education reach is like another and awareness. There is very, very less awareness when it comes to uh, you know, disabilities. Um, majorly intellectual disabilities and disabilities concerning integration uh, issues, the sense integration issues like autism, ADHD. So rehabilitation services in India are divided into majorly into four, four things like hospital provide them, rehabilitation centers, private centers provide them. There are NGOs, community uh, centers and individual. So when it comes to hospital, hospitals are not are not in vicinity. They are far, so pa parents or patients have to travel to hospital. Rehabilitation centers they they don't give appropriate time slots as which are convenient to parents to for their children. NGOs NGOs do not provide all the uh, holistic care. They might have a special educator or a OT occupation therapist, but not a speech therapist. So it happens all the time. And the issue with individual and personal is there is nobody to guide them or uh, to change the plan, to monitor the progress, etc. Hey, now LFL, how LFL work? LFL work in two ways. In providing uh, home-based sessions, the therapist goes to the home, and second is online services. So starting from initial assessment, after initial assessment, we do counseling of the parents, and we tell them what support your child need, and after that, we, we assign them a professional. And the professional is not just one professional. If a child needs uh, occupation therapy at this some point, but uh, there's a team of professionals like speech therapists, psychologists, who will be giving support online. Uh, if, the, if the OT is going to the, uh, into the home, the, uh, the other professional will give support online. And then we make a plan. The plan consists of short-term goals, long-term goals, and then we we implement it and we keep tracking the progress. So these are the few thera therapies that we provide. You can see uh, occupation therapists, speech therapists, psychologists, and special educators. So impact. So impact is um, as a home based service provider and online service provider, we don't we don't change therapist. The the issue that uh, I I listen from parents is the therapy in centers and hospitals. The therapist is changed frequently. One day there's another therapist. So the, the repo building is not established. So here if with us, we don't change uh, therapist usually until parent asks for it. So consistent care uh, is given with the same therapist. And there's flexibility of appointments. Uh, if if a, if a parent or child is available at six from six to seven p.m., we give them that slot. Uh, we we don't. We don't give them our slot, but we ask them what slot you need, what is convenient to you. And support to the family uh, in forms of education material, training to parents or the home based program that parents can implement at home. And there's no waiting, of course, because uh, the slot are as per parents choice. Assured privacy. And no accessibility challenge. And yeah, we also uh, help, help, help parents to understand the ergonomic need of the child if required. And we do give, uh, we do provide consultation if, if they want to change the home environment some for the child to be more accessible. The services focus towards inclusive development. We use all international standards. Multiple payment options are available and transparent cost structure. We, the, the cost structure is same throughout the country, integrating um, interactive activity into therapy. We, we do get pain counseling, etc. Yeah. So value driven impact. So uh, as I discussed, there are multiple issues when it comes to hospitals, clinical setups, and when it comes to love for life organization, we are economical because parents are not traveling. They're saving their time and money in traveling. 
and we are definitely convenient for the working parent who reach off from off from home from office at six o'clock in the evening and then taking the child to therapy center it is really inconvenient so here we come in and we are really convenient so here i have few testimonials for you from the happy parents so i'll read one to you The team is knowledgeable as well as empathetic in understanding the issue of the child and accordingly recommending a plan of action which eases the worry of parent. The service is very prompt, professional, and occupation therapists provide you the job well. So this is one that I read for you. So working uh, to overcome challenges. So basically, the, the challenge that we face uh, and the parent phase is Im impact funding. Qualified professional, there are professional available, but still we 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 give our time and energy to uh, to train them before after we hired them. So lack of awareness and acceptance in parents, and this comes as a big challenge in remote area and rural area, because uh, these intellectual disabilities are still considered taboo. Insurance coverage, uh, in my country, uh, insurance uh, coverage is very very. Uh, less when it comes to rehabilitation services. Very uh, few people are covered in insurance, so it's a huge challenge. Maintaining cost effectiveness uh, and zero barrier infrastructure. That's again being a developing country. It's a barrier for us. So next step for my making India truly inclusive for us, uh, we want to integrate more and more technology uh, so that we can reach more and more people in remote and rural area. And uh, remote uh, monitoring solutions. Yeah. So uh, basically, uh, we we do monitor our our children who are work, we, whom we are working with, but uh, we wanted to take it to uh, with the technology so that we can constantly monitor their progress through technology, and parents can also be the part of that. Uh, partnership and co collaborations. We are open to partnership and collaboration. Policy and advocacy, as I told you, insurance is a um, is a huge issue in um, in my country. So we are advocating for we are doing advocacy for that, and community network. Uh, so before I end, um, I I'm looking forward for the more inclusive world, uplifting family and up, uplifting entire community in all walks of life um, through collaboration and partnership. And also yesterday, the parliamentary event, uh, Mr. Martin SL uh, said something which I totally uh, I want to I stand by it. Inclusion is a prerequisite for a self-determined life and prospect. Thank you. Yes, a great thank you also from my side to all the overdies and presenters here. I think it was really overwhelming what we have heard here and seen here and um, um, throughout all the different countries. And also I think the last word from my side to the to the presentations is that really your your name of your organization, Love for Life, I think this is also crucial if we really would like to to um, to help all the people, all the all the children with disabilities, and all the people who are um, getting the um, higher qualified uh, education, then we really should do it by our heart. And I think we keep we keep doing this here in in this room and all the other rooms with the Zero Project family. And um, with this, I um, yeah, we have like a few minutes left. And I would like to open the floor now to you for a couple of minutes. The audience, do you have any questions that you want to raise or remarks? Then please, yeah. This man over there, can you please present yourself? Um, hi, uh, my name's Guy from Sightsavers, and I really want to thank the panel for their wonderful presentations. I did notice that in uh, quite a lot of the, these presentations, there were talks about individual learning plans for children with disabilities. Now, I mean, given you know the the, the fact that in in some contexts, and I think probably in 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 Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh, often you've got large numbers of children, um, relatively few resources, 
maybe caregivers with limited levels of literacy. I'd be really be really interesting to know how you manage individual learning plans in those contexts and whether you think that in some cases actually um, an individual learning plan may not be necessary for some children. Thank you. Of course. <laughs> Yes, actually, as you have very correctly pointed out. For all children with disabilities, because they have some specific characteristics. They cannot learn in a regular school because of their own specific characteristics. So the teacher has got to pay attention to them. For them to catch up with the remaining children with going to the school going so. That is what I base. That's how we came up with this plan. Individual learning plan. In fact, Diana, when she was making the presentation, she showed some five areas. Areas in which. These individual because these children, they have not at all gone to school. They need to be trained, systematized into going into a school. So that to prepare the children to perform to their optimum level. Be before they join in a regular school, we will have a consultation process. Correct me if I'm wrong. Correct how it works out in other places also. We have an individual consultation with the child, his parents, based on which. We come up with a plan for him to him or she to join up in the mainstream schools. So individualized education plan. In a government school or in a private school. Is an important component. For learning of children disabilities. Across the board, but the problem is. The problem is of the numbers. The problem is of the numbers because. The numbers of children with disabilities. In India is so huge, massive. That. It is not imaginable. So we have to. Focus on each child and come up with a plan, but. It's a very, very. Humongous problem because. The details, the devil is in the details, so details need to be worked out for it to be effective. Yes, ma'am. Over to you. Yes, please, please. I can just add. Thank you so much. <laughs> to answer to your first question, uh, the there is definitely limited um, literacy. So uh, we as an organization, we work with um, local uh, primary health workers and ASHA workers uh, who are definitely from the same area and they and they there is no language barrier there. So we train them and they, they in, in return train the parents. So that's one thing that we do. And uh, to answer your second question, IEP is not required for every child. Uh, I think um, no two individuals are same. So I think IEP is really needed for it. It's it good for every child. Because every there might be few overlapping um, issues, but there might be a, a more more to one child and less to one, another child. So I think IP is, is a good good way. Just go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> OK, I'd just like to add on to it. Um, so for us, we make IPs for every child. And as you rightly mentioned, the literacy rate in Pakistan is of, of course very low. Hence that is well taken care of. We have one on one sessions with the parents before we take in the child. We assess their environmental situations as well. So if it's say, for example, how literate the parent is, that will be dependent on how much home plans we will be giving to the child and how much can be left on to the parent. Secondly, IAPs are important because this, we take out student learning objectives out of those IAPs on a monthly basis. That's how we monitor the development of that child. It goes back to the IAP which was set and every month we have separate SLOs, which are the student learning objectives. 
And that is basically the benchmark against which we gauge the students' performance. If I, yeah, I what are the Thank you so much. Exactly, Diana. It's your it's your floor now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And yeah, I'll do a quick wrap up. Just to be technically um, answering that question, um, disability is divided, like all of us know, into mild, moderate, severe, and profound. And the mild and the profound categories, that is the uh, in the spectrum of uh, the classification, the mild and the profound, like. Um, the person in the hall is asking really the IEPs sometimes really can be overlooked and uh, can be also um, classified into groups uh, like we can put students into groups and the mild categories can actually need not have an IEP in specific uh, while the profound also did but it's for the moderate uh, and um, you know severe that we really really have to focus on IEPs because their learning curves uh, have shown greater impact in terms of IEP intervention. So, just being technical about it, the mild and the profound, we can actually um, kind of work on uh, baseline stuff and see uh, how they progress. While the severe and profound really need IEP plans that sh have shown uh, them to be excelling in a whole lot of areas. OK, thank you so much, Diana. Um, is there someone from the online audience that would like to to put a question or to put something in the chat that I should raise? OK, thank you. That's a good I that's a good. Um, good answer to know it. Um, is there somebody else having another question now? Or are you feeling like digesting all this different information? Yeah, thank you. Go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, I really see there is some light for people, persons with disabilities. My, but my question is, uh, do we teach rituals like the others or do we have adapted the curriculum? Because we are, I see in many of the developing countries, when we are talking, we are always in the one size fits all. Every child has to read, every child has to write. Is that the case also? Whereas I see there is a need of looking at uh, adapted curriculum so that children can learn what they can learn instead of forcing them to learn things that they cannot use in their life. Thank you. Thank you so much. We can have a quick answer before we close the session, unfortunately. <laughs> Who I would like me, I you. talked about the adapting curriculum. Actually, I was talking about the early childhood education. And that is group history plus we in the normal education. We are saying it's a play group education. So there is some area uh, that hot their developmental milestone and what they will learn. So in practice, most of the countries have far I experienced. This is they have very rarely they use very structured educational books and things. We call it learn from the nature, learn, learn, learn from the theme or product or the shape or size. So on that concept, we make some skeleton that where we can start with the children. As I mentioned, that play, play, play therapy is one of the important area. The play-based education, uh, and it, uh, we have a partner working in the US, and they are giving a lot of emphasis for the children, children developmental uh, age. The play therapy is very helpful. So, things is that in an education for the children with disabilities who are the uh, severely disabled or it's very difficult to bring them in a mainstream education. They need some uh, adaptive uh, curriculum, which is the two types we are really practicing. One is the teacher has some uh, capacity and uh, a guideline that how far he can adapt in the classroom. Another is the as education materials is range is quite a high level, which can adapt according to the children need and also the uh, socio economical context. Thank you so much, Fagida, and I hope this uh, really could answer your question. 
And uh, yeah, with this, so we are we are at the end of our session. Um, yeah, I congratulate you uh, that you that you have been here in this room with us, and thank you so much. And I think um, all the panelists would be open for for having other discussions with you uh, right during the day or in the next days, and we will see each other around the floor and the other rooms. So thank you very much to the audience, to the online participants and to the technical part here also and to the sign language interpreters as well.